The Primer, A Guide to the Truth, by Jivan David Budu. This book is my gift to humanity, and as such, will always be available free of charge to anyone willing to read it. Under no circumstances should any individual, group, or organization gain monetary profits from distributing this piece of literature. Chapter 4 From a Single Cell to the Brink of Humanity Moving right along, this chapter will cover the second largest span of time in this book. Where Chapter 2 got us to the formation of the Sun, covering 8.8 .8 billion years, this chapter will cover the roughly 3.8 billion years it took for a single cell to replicate through to the dawn of humanity's separation into its own species. So how did a single cell make that journey across time? Not only that, how did it do so when the Earth only provided minerals and water, with the sun providing energy in the form of light? Onward and forward we go, my friends. Replication Ultimately, that is the most fundamental answer to that question, replicating itself more times than our brains could begin to fathom. I've never looked into any attempted calculations to find an estimate of how many cells have ever existed, but I imagine the number would approach one of the larger numbers the universe has produced, and the process is still going. The other aspect to this question is that DNA works to reorganize the materials of its environment to perpetuate itself. But if all of that happened with the original cell duplicating itself, how did so many variations come to exist? The answer? Errors, otherwise known as mutations. As I hope you've been diligently paying attention, we have seen that everything made of energy in the universe, whether it be a star, planet, moon, DNA, or cell, is produced if the environment selects it to be. And as that law falls in line with the stimulus dictating the response, SDR from now on, this process is no different. First, how could a cell that floated into being in a small body of water result in larger life beginning in the ocean? Again, this being my hypothesis, I'll give you my take. We know all of the continents sit atop enormous tectonic plates. Essentially, huge flat rock formations that slide over large periods of time due to oceanic pressures and seismic activities generated below. The continents as we see them today have only looked like this for approximately 100 million years. Before that time, all of our continental landmasses were joined together to form a supercontinent we call Pangaea. And before Pangaea, there were numerous other configurations as our planet played its own version of continental Tetris. When the plates move two landmasses into each other, mountains form, separate them, and the oceans fill the gap. These plates do move at a turtle's pace, mind you, crawling along at about 2.5 centimeters or 1 inch per year. There's just so much mass that even at that pace, the amount of moving energy requires an equal and opposing force to bring it to a halt. Newton's third law. With that in mind, we have two options for the transfer of our genetic code to the oceans. One, flooding caused the transfer from a small body of water to a larger one. Two, continental drift made the transfer, or some combination of both. It might be by some other means that I am not aware of, but it happened and I'm grateful it did. We know that numerous species of a given environment made it to land masses where they had no previous ancestral connection, nor any means of traversing thousands of kilometers of ocean, suggesting continental drift being the causal force driving their migrations. Over millions of years, the descendants of our godfather cell replicated, with most mutations proving unbeneficial, while those that allowed greater adaptability to the environment propagated into future generations. Say a mutation allowed a cell to connect cell walls with another cell, granting them the ability to collect materials needed to replicate as a pair rather than as an individual, this would give them an advantage their offspring would be likely to inherit this pair bonding ability, and as long as the environment didn't prove this mutation to be a deterrent to the replication process, these attached cells would eventually grow in number. Is this exactly how it happened? I don't know. It could have been a single cell possessed a mutation that allowed it to replicate itself and stay attached to its offspring. Either way, the process of the environment selecting the mutations that best adapt to it is 100% the way single cells transitioned into multicellular organisms. That is without a doubt. 
Eventually, through this SDR, an organism formed that exists to this very day called mycelium. To say this creation of DNA is important to everything that followed is an understatement of epic proportions. What is mycelium? Funnily, if you've ever dug up dirt, you have probably seen it. It looks like white strands of delicate thread woven into the soil. If you don't know or recognize what it looks like, search for a picture or go out and do some digging. This incredible life form adapted to survive by breaking down the tough rock and consuming the minerals trapped within. That deconstructed rock then became soil. It isn't an exaggeration to say that mycelium geoengineered the planet for all of the life that would grow on the Earth's surface. This, of course, took billions of years, roughly two billion years from the formation of the first cell. Then, as late as 1.6 billion years ago, a mutation, or many, caused this fungal entity to begin flowering mushrooms. How do we know this? The oldest fossil of a mushroom found to date was dated to that time. This incredible discovery suggests a few things. 1. Since mushrooms consume oxygen and release carbon dioxide as animals do, there must have been an abundance of oxygen in the atmosphere. 2. The other thing we might infer is that the mineral densities in the soil were possibly being depleted by mycelium, and this mutation kept it alive. 3. Mycelium paves its own way, baby. It really is incredible. The oxygen density must have been really high for a very long time because we have found fossils of mushrooms as large as trees. These were not of the umbrella-shaped variety, but rather tall and slender like the trunk of a tree with the branches shaved off. This was the norm for a very long time, hundreds of millions of years. And over the course of that time, carbon dioxide levels would have steadily climbed with no green plant life using it to fuel their growth and reproduction. This brings us to the period roughly 650 million years ago. It is here where we find evidence for the first plant and animal life forms. Before we get to our planet when it was most recognizable to us, we need a brief understanding of how cells develop two distinct ways to use the sun's byproduct, light, to their advantage. So far, you've seen that as the descendants of the godfather cell multiplied, over billions of years, it presented mutations from which the environment selected which genes would populate future generations. Over that time, some cells mutated protrusions that granted them mobility. Some of these extensions look like little hairs that the cell could control to writhe themselves through the water to find food. Others had long tail-like structures similar to a sperm cell that they used to move themselves. At some point during this extraordinarily long period of development, one cell mutated an ability to absorb photons of light and use that energy for itself. Light as a source of energy is essentially endless, unless there's a cloudy day, and it would give an incredible advantage to a cell who could capitalize on this perpetual abundance of fuel. This is the dawn of our biological ancestry using the star at the heart of our solar system as a source of life-giving energy something humanity will learn to control and utilize hundreds of millions of years later. At first, cells with this ability would have only had rudimentary abilities of utilizing the energy they gathered from light. As this trait's advantage gained dominance and the population of these cells grew, so did the potential for more mutations. With rising carbon dioxide in the atmosphere due to the burgeoning mushroom population, any mutation that would lead to an organism taking advantage of these molecules as a fuel source would be quite the genetic lottery jackpot. As you can guess, mutations of these photoreceptor cells eventually led to the development of a molecular pigment called chlorophyll, the part of a cell and some single-celled organisms that makes them green. Chlorophyll allows a cell to absorb light, and by using carbon dioxide, Water and sugars are generated to allow the plant to grow, and as a byproduct of this chemical reaction, oxygen atoms are released. As we have already seen, anything that facilitates an advantage in cellular reproduction will naturally cause a boom in that population. When we look at nature, it is obvious that life evolved to survive by recycling itself. The raw materials in rock simply became reorganized to form biology, 
and outside of simple life forms that require only minerals, and plants which get the majority of their energy once they mature from the sun, all other life forms need biological material for sustenance. I'm not aware of many, if any, animals that can live on dirt, as an example. Life evolved to feed itself. Keep that in mind when a dogmatic religious Jehovah's vegan begins preaching to you that which they do not understand. With that in mind, the fact that we have a new abundance of biological material in the form of these light receptor cells, any mutation that could use them as a fuel source would be set up to thrive. By this time, single-celled organisms would have thrived as cellular material was abundant even before the light absorbers came to be. Naturally, some of the more primitive cells would continue feeding off of the plentiful amount of raw material still available from the formation of the planet. Also naturally would any mutations propagate that allowed for a cell to become carnivorous towards the mineral minor organisms or their remains. That all being said, what if a cell mutated the ability to simply detect where light was coming from? Inherently, there is no advantage to this adaptation. What if you are a carnivorous cell who mutates this way and there is an abundance of cells near the surface of the water you're in, gathering light to fuel themselves? This, of course, would be another genetic jackpot. These light-seeking carnivores consume the light miners. The material released as waste drifts downwards, and fuel is available for other types of cells. Life feeds itself. Eventually, these two types of photoreceptive cells would evolve into multicellular organisms. The light miners would become plants, and light seekers the neural eyes of the animal kingdom. So far, this chapter takes place over the course of 3 billion years, leading us to 650 million years ago. These time frames always make me pause and get swept away by the enormity of time it took for all of these adaptations to develop. And all of it occurred because nothing the environment produced could stop DNA from keeping its structure moving on to future generations. We made a journey of understanding across 13 billion years and we finally reached a period of biological life our basic senses evolved to recognize. As plants evolved to grow to where water would no longer act as a barrier to their light-gathering duties, they began populating the land above their aquatic womb. Above the water, the abundance of carbon dioxide caused an explosion of plant growth. Within millions of years and numerous mutational diversions, or speciation, trees and other types of plants found their niche adaptations a home as they expanded into different climates. Meanwhile, animal life in the oceans was also booming. Multicellular bottom feeders continued adapting through mutations, gaining specialized cells for motion, respiration, digestion, and more. These photoreceptor cells would become the foundational neural cells that would evolve to send messages to one another through light pulses, and eventually form the first primitive brain. This also shows that the eyes are part of your brain and not separate organs as our species believes. The implications this had and continues to have on human interaction and development is quite large, as you'll see in a later chapter. Ah, the brain. The beginning stages of its development would have been something to behold. With over 650 million years of development, it eventually became the most intricate and complex structure we can find in the universe. Every day, humans should spend a few quiet moments of reflection on everything the brain DNA developed has accomplished and what it does for you. We'll go in depth into the brain's majesty later, but it is important to appreciate that we are at its starting point in our journey. At this stage, neurons in a single organism range in number from a few to thousands as time progressed. These primitive cognitive centers allowed their hosts to detect the environment around them with greater accuracy and make the limited calculated reactions programmed into future generations if they provided an advantage. SDR at work here developing the basic brain all animal life would inherit. Over time, the oceans became populated with a rich diversity of life. This life evolved from asexual cellular life to the sexually dimorphic animal life that dominates to this day. That's right. No matter what human parasites and their foolish sheep tried to convince humanity, life that is asexual is more primitive, 
and only two sexes and expressions of gender proved advantageous as life evolved through SDR. The environments all across our magnificent globe deleted life, particularly animal life, that did not abide by the male and female biological archetypes. Attempts to subvert societies into believing anything else are being done with malicious intent to devolve societies into being more primitive. There will be a chapter dedicated to the spiteful mutants and the human parasites that use them to corrupt societies later on. For now, just be aware of how ancient and fundamental this aspect of biological life, sexual dimorphism, is, and that male and female biology are hundreds of millions of years old and they are not going anywhere. Notice also that there was never sexual trimorphism or more. That is to say, it never developed that life needed male, female, and LGBT blah 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 to propagate life. It wasn't that a female fish lay her eggs, then a male fertilized her eggs with his man juice, and then they needed some non-binary gender non-conforming tranny fish to come by and sprinkle queer fairy dust over the lot to complete the process. The first two steps were all that were needed from this point on for 99.9999999% of all animal life, and humanity is no exception. Deviating from male and female, and their biological roles, means one thing and one thing only. Those genes would not make it into future generations and are only produced by errors in the replication process of DNA or destructive environmental stimuli. And just because there are a minute percent of a percent of instances where a few species deviate from the norm, it does not prove anything since it only worked in these specific cases under those particular conditions. Back to our blooming aquatic animal life. The oceans became populated with fish of an incredible variety in size, colors, shape, diet, and special abilities. Jellyfish came along with an incredible ability to continuously regenerate their simple cells so well, we have trouble determining the ages of the ones alive today. Cephalopods emerged and speciated into octopi, squid, cuttlefish, and others of which I'm unaware. Crustaceans of the lobster, crab, shrimp, and other varieties evolved the ability to manufacture chitin, the material used to create their tough outer casings, and more. Up to this point, however, there were no mammals in the ocean, and no animal life on land surface could be found, but that was all about to change. After a significant period of time with plants dominating the land masses, oxygen levels would have been very high. All aquatic animal life evolved to derive its oxygen by extracting it from water, water being made of one oxygen atom and two hydrogen. During this period of an oxygen-rich atmosphere, a mutation, or more likely a series of them, granted some type of aquatic animal the hybrid ability to get its oxygen straight out of the air and or water. Why would this be an advantage? Consider that if this animal ate plants in the water, and him being the only one on land with an endless buffet of plant life on the surface, he suddenly has no competition. He could fuel himself to his heart's desire and return to the water world to mate. Any of the offspring he passed his genes to containing these mutations would gain his advantage. As the population of these first amphibious creatures grew, so were the chances of mutations that caused fins or appendages adapted for moving through water to become more arm or leg-like. Added mobility would give them greater range of motion and access to food. Over the course of millions of years, this sequence of tested mutations would evolve the land dwellers past their need for their aquatic habitat by transforming their water breathing apparatuses into more robust lungs and breathing pathways for the open atmosphere. It would also lend to increased mutational loads as more direct exposure to the sun's radiation would force adaptations of tougher skin, not a necessity for ocean life. Eyes would take a very long time to focus as well outside of the water as it initially evolved within the medium where light is constantly reflected and refracted. These new conditions would also be harder on eggs laid and exposed to the harsher environment surface dwelling entails. The outer casing would evolve to be harder and stronger over time as this would protect the precious life within better than the soft outer skins eggs generally have in the water. Millions of years of SDR evolution and speciation expanded with mutations continuing to separate ancestral lineages to provide newer adaptations to ever-changing environments. As animal life spread, 
they forced plants into adaptive mutations, further diversifying them as well. I hypothesized that tiny, simple sea creatures would have evolved the ability to breathe outside their water womb and begin testing their abilities. Mutations that transition fins into larger, lighter appendages would eventually become wings, allowing them to escape the water world altogether. Other small aquatic life could have left the oceans with more legs as crustaceans have. These types of events would lead to the birth of the insect population. By this point, many millions of years have passed. Herbivorous animals of many kinds are now normal and have thriving populations. Insects who evolved to lay many eggs in each season would be booming. And all of these new biological organizations of atomic matter from the water lives and dies, enriching the soil as it cycles through the natural order. Mycelium now has a steady supply of food to consume, including dead trees which the Grand Jew engineer blossoms mushrooms to help break the wood down to its simpler components. Have you ever walked through a forest or wood and seen a fallen tree with shelf-like mushrooms growing out of the trunk? What you are seeing is the very slow process of mycelium and its mushroom offspring eating the remains of that tree, which takes decades. If you haven't seen this, you need to spend more time in nature. Along the evolutionary path, a certain animal mutated the ability to gestate its young within its own body, rather than externally through the laying of eggs. This would have been the first ancestor of the mammalian family. This has the advantage of being able to defend your unborn offspring from its environment better than an egg could, but it also means that the female now has less mobility and increased biological stress during the gestation period. Whether this type of mutation occurred in other species, I'm not sure. It is more likely that mammals stem from a single ancestor who thrived and speciated over hundreds of millions of years, by my estimation, unless the environment provided selection pressures that encouraged its development in multiple non-mammalian species. The other reason it seems more likely that mammals have a single ancestral beginning is how few mammals there are to non-mammals, and how many similarities mammalians share. As the mammalian population grew and the potential for mutations grew, somewhere along the way, one genetic line developed the necessary adaptations to return to the ocean environment and thrive. Eventually, the hind legs fused together to become a single appendage in the form of a tail, and the nose mutated upwards for many of them, producing blowholes. These became the orcas, which include dolphins and whales. Others who retain their breathing apparatuses at the front of their faces are now what we call manatees, seals, and walruses. During later periods, oxygen levels were very high as plant life thrived. Volcanoes were active over these times, giving more growth material for plants through fresh, mineral-rich soil left from magma eruptions. As the oxygen became plentiful, so did the size of the animals, eventually leading to the giants that ruled the earth, dinosaurs. To know the exact order that led to each transitory stage of the evolutionary path that got us to today is a wish I would love to come true. Despite not having this knowledge, Understanding how this process works grants you the opportunity to gain the perspective necessary to appreciate life and how much it took for life to make it as far as it did. In the end, it started with a molecule, and the Earth experienced a change that we haven't found with any ease elsewhere in our Milky Way galaxy. The dinosaurs dominated both aquatic and land environments for millions of years. As a child, learning about these thunder lizards was one of the great joys of my school days, and they still managed to captivate me with the variety of adaptive qualities they produced. Their fate, however, was subject to an impact of an asteroid where Mexico is now, whose journey probably took millions of years. Roughly 66 million years ago, on that fateful day, most of the large life forms were doomed to their horrific demise as a lump of space rock the size of a small city crashed into the Earth's surface. The shockwave of the collision was felt around the globe as the energy transferred off the large mass, combined with the speed at the point of impact, sent millions of tons of debris into the air to circumnavigate the globe. This debris was in such large quantity that the cloud of dust severely restricted the amount of sunlight that would reach the surface. The period that followed, we call an ice age, as the planet became a mostly icy ball. 
This catastrophic event is one of the greatest tests the universe has put life on our planet through, and yet DNA had propagated so many variations within its coding that life would not be exterminated. With plants producing a fraction of the oxygen they did before the impact, the large masses of dinosaurs could not maintain their functions, and the ones who weren't instantly obliterated died slower, more agonizing deaths. Imagine watching everything around you die and not having an understanding of why. Such a tragic end. Fortunately for us, the advantage of gestating your young within a mother's body was advantageous enough to allow for a relative boom in the mammalian population relative to the previous dominant population of egg layers. In the end, this cataclysmic event developed the conditions and the life forms that allowed for humanity to begin our journey, which is where we are headed next.